If you're new to this, you might be asking yourself, what are arrays? Let's talk about arrays in Java. Um, now, first off, there are methods and functions built into arrays, and so you may choose to import the Java Utilities Arrays package to implement and utilize those methods. Um, but let's go over the attributes of a basic array. First, an array is a collection of objects. So you could think of an array as, you know, a data type, a variable that is a collection of other objects, you know, kind of string together. Think of it maybe like a pillbox. Um, now there are some restrictions um, on the, the structure of an array, and that is all the objects have to be of the same size, the same data type. So in other words, we couldn't have an array of, you know, integers and doubles. Or we could not have an array composed of strings and integers. So if we have an array, it's going to be just one single data type, a data primitive, all integers, all doubles, all strings, or it could be an array of objects that we created. Let's say we wrote <coughs> the person class, or the dragon class, or the alien class. Then we could have an array of people, or an array of dragons, or an array of aliens. Once an array is built, it cannot be resized. Okay. Now later we'll look at array lists, and array lists can be resized. They're dynamic and they can shrink and they can expand as needed. But an array itself, you know, just an array type object, cannot be resized. Objects stored in an array are referred to as elements. Okay. An object stored in an array is indexed by a subscript value. And this is just a numerical value that goes inside of square brackets. And that's how you access that particular object stored um, in the array. The first element in an array is always indexed as zero and not one. And this is, you know, sort of creates a little bit of caution when you're using arrays. They're very powerful when you combine them with, you know, looping and repetition structures. Um, they can do a lot in terms of, of coding logic. However, um, you know, one of the common mistakes people make, um, you know, I still have been using them for years and I still make the mistake every now and then is you'll kind of miscalculate by one when you're looping something. And that's because as human beings, we tend to start at one, whereas arrays, you know, the computer starts at zero. And that's called the off by one or fence post era. And that's something you'll want to be careful about as you use arrays and loops in your programming. Declaring and initializing a one-dimensional array sized automatically. So I have several arrays here, and in the first example, A, we're declaring and initializing a one-dimensional automatically sized array. In other words, we're not passing a, a number and creating it of a fixed size, but its size is automatically determined by the number of values that we specify as its elements, number of objects. Now, once this statement is executed, then that array is of a fixed size, and we can't really resize it. Um, but you know, this way I don't actually have to count out the number of objects and then you know, populate the array with objects in a separate step. This is all in the same step here. And the syntax for that is going to be the access modifier, public, static in this example because it's a global and we only have a single class, so it doesn't require instantiation. The data type, in this case a data primitive, an integer and empty square brackets here, the name of the array, which can be anything that you like, the assignment operator, and then in curly braces, um, you know, the number, of, the, the, <clears throat> the objects that you want to store in the array. In this case, integers and their values would be 1, 2, 3, and 4. Declaring a one-dimensional array sized manually. In the next example, we have a one-dimensional fixed size array. All right, and in this example, the syntax is the same pretty much, with the exception that here I'm, you know, we're passing in a number. So that builds the array or constructs the array of a fixed size of 100 elements um, manually, I guess. And this automatically would build an array of fixed size with four elements. Okay. Now, in this situation here, we'd have to populate the array with a for loop. We'd have to go and you know build objects you know, place objects inside the array before we accessed any elements there or we, we would get a null pointer, you know, exception. Let's take a peek at parallel arrays. Next we have two uh, one-dimensional arrays, but they're parallel arrays. And that means that they run along side by side, they have a parallel relationship. Um, 
and a lot of times people use parallel arrays in projects, they may be arrays of different data types. And every element in one array relates to or has a relationship with every element in another array. They could also be of the same data type, but in this case we have an array of integers and an array of strings. They both have four elements, and element 0, 1, 2, and 3, as they would be indexed of the array of strings, would relate to elements 0, 1, 2, and 3 in the array of integers, such that score 1 is 1,000, score 2 is 5,000, score 3 is 10,000, score 4 is 25,000. And we could associate names with, um, you know, ages or social security numbers or IDs or whatever. But there are all kinds of situations and logic where you can utilize parallel arrays. Declaring and initializing a two-dimensional array. In our next example, we have a, a two-dimensional array. In this case, a strings for a trivia game. Notice that there's two sets of empty square brackets instead of one. And in this case, we're building and initializing the array with string objects all in one step. Notice that everything is between these outer curly braces here. And we terminate it with a semicolon. And then we have these sets of inner curly braces inside. And they're separated by commas on the outside. Okay. And then within those curly braces, we have other, you know, strings and they're separated by commas. Okay. Well, the first dimension of the array is represented or defined by these outer braces here that you see separated by commas. Okay. And the second dimension of the array is defined inside of these braces. And that's the strings that you see inside these braces here. Also, is each one of you know being separated by a comma. And in database terminology, people would you know say that this these are the rows of the array. So you could think of the first dimension as rows, and you could think of the second dimension as columns. So imagine a table, if you will. So if these are the rows, as defined by these outer curly braces here, separated by commas, then the columns would be within the curly braces, also separated by commas. And the way this works is there are one, two, three, four, five question and answer combinations. And everything has a relationship and would be considered a row or a single record. And here's the way it goes. The first string element is the question. And inside of a for loop, that would be displayed as a question. The next one's an answer. And that's what we, it would be compared to to see whether or not the player had input the right answer. The third one is a hint. If they get it wrong, we'll give them a hint until they exceed the maximum number of wrong guesses. The next four are multiple choice options. And there's a difficulty level setting. And if they choose easy, it's multiple choice. If they choose more difficult, then they actually have to type in the answer, which requires, you know, a little bit more, you know, knowledge perhaps than simply selecting A, B, C, D. And so in this case, question, answer, hint, multiple choice, you know, options A, B, C, and D. The correct multiple choice option are again the answer for multiple choice there. And this last one, this empty one, just stores the player answer. Okay, and this structure is in every single row. Every single row has the same columns inside of it, okay? So just an example of a two-dimensional array. Here's another example of a two-dimensional array. In this case, we're constructing a chessboard. All right, 64 squares total, so we have eight rows and eight columns per row. Let's say we were going to create another... Uh, two-dimensional array of integers and this time we would automatically assign values it would be like this um, we will call this um, a table table one okay that'll be what we call it and we could initialize in a single step or fill that you know populate the array with values like so and this you know, again, the inner and outer closing brace and the semicolon that represents both the rows and the columns would go inside there. And then we would have nested inner braces separated by commas that would represent each row. Okay. And I'll just try to do this.
Okay. So these here would be the rows. We haven't done anything for the columns yet as far as initializing values, but notice the rows are themselves are between curly braces and they're all separated by commas. And then all of that is nested inside these outer open and closing curly braces and terminated with a semicolon. Okay. And again, for the values, I could do Okay. And we could just go all, you know, we could keep going all the way down, but then these would become the columns in the table, and these would be the rows. See what we're saying? Okay. Um, our next example, let's take a look at populating an array. Okay. Um, in this example, we're setting up an array of 10 strings, but it hasn't been initialized. So essentially, yes, we have an array that can hold 10 strings, but they're null objects. And I wouldn't want to loop through it and try to access those objects until I populated the array with actual string objects. And so to do that, you simply call the new operator on the class of object that you want to build. And that could also be a programmer defined class you could build an array of people objects, or an array of monsters, or dragons, or unicorns, or whatever you wanted to build there. Populating an array. For our next example, let's take a look at populating an array with uh, string values. Okay, so in this example, in this function, we're declaring an array of strings, and we're instantiating or building these strings inside the array. And I'm inside of a repetition structure, a for loop. So in this case, I'm going to loop 10 times. And I could do this. Um, I could hard code the value. I could also use the array name. And uh, there's a special attribute that you can call on an array. And that is the length attribute. And that would simply automatically cycle through uh, all of the elements in the array. It just returns the value of the number of elements in the array. So in the for loop, we're just going to instantiate a new string object for every single element in the array so there's no null objects. And this is called populating the array. And then once we do that we're going to display them one by one, element by element, down here. So if we do this, let's go ahead and build the project just to see what that looks like. So I'm going to build the project and notice elements 0 through 9. There's 10 elements but remember it's you know off by 1 because we start at 0 not at 1. So and we're just concatenating a string, so string plus 0 through 9. And then these would be the string values now stored in that array location. So that's called populating an array. And usually when you create an array, you want to do that. You want to instantiate, you know, build actual objects and store them in every element. You don't want to have a null uh, element or an element, with, you know, basically what would be a null pointer exception in Java and C++. And in addition to built-in objects, we can also uh, create arrays of programmer-defined or user-defined objects. In other words, classes of objects that you create yourself. Building and populating an array with class objects. First, let's create our own data type, a dragon. So to test this, let's build a programmer-defined class. And in the default package, we'll make the dragon class. Okay, and it'll just be an empty class. We'll add a constructor. And remember, most functions have the return type void if they don't return a value, but the constructor is an exception. It doesn't need the return type void in front of it. It doesn't need to be public, and it has to be the same name as the class. And in the body of the function, we're just going to s display something in the console. So. Basically, we'll give ourselves some feedback that we are we're building a dragon, okay? So you can see the process of instantiation and how that's happening. And let's add a private data member. Um, health. And another private data member. Okay. 
just to see how we would access these objects. All right. And we'll give those initial default values and we'll add a couple of accessories in here and get an asset. couple of accessors, just a statement in the constructor, and some private data. And let's go ahead and save that. And there's our class. Now let's build an array of dragons and populate it with new dragon objects. So now to build an array of that type of object, we just follow the same example we have up here. So we used a simple data type of string. Now we're going to declare a programmer defined data type. And we'll call it array of dragons. And we'll give it the same number of elements, in this case 10. All right, 10 elements. Now the array is empty at this point and we have to populate it. So just like we did up here, we're gonna to wanna to populate the array. And a quick and easy way to do that, of course, is a for loop. And we have to give the for loop an initial value. We'll just use x again there. It's local to the for loop, so we can redeclare it. Doesn't matter. Or you could declare it at the top of the function or reuse it if you wanted to. Um, we can either specify 10 if we're going to hard code the value. Or remember, there's that length attribute we can use. And that makes our code a little bit more dynamic. That way, if we change the size of the array, we don't have to worry about changing the value or the number of iterations in the for loop. It'll change automatically. So, you know, because of that, a lot of programmers like to use that attribute of arrays. And then inside the loop, we just want to instantiate an object inside of every element. So, array of dragons. And in this case, it's indexed, you know, the subscript value is going to be x, and we would build a new dragon there, okay? And then, you know, we could do other things as well. We could set an attribute, um, you know, once we did that. Let's say, let's see, what were some of our functions or methods there? Get health, set health, okay. So let's do this. We're going to say, Array of dragons dot, and this would be on the heap in C++, so you'd use the area, but in Java, just use the dot operator, okay? And dot, notice here's, you know, autocomplete pops up here with all the functions that we can utilize there. So let's call our first one set health, okay? And we will do, let's do, We'll do x plus 100. All right, that'll be the value of health. And why don't we call set name? And to give it a unique name value, let's just do And let's see, we will 
we'll just concatenate that to the value of x there, convert it to a string, right? So we're going to build a new dragon, and it would be a mistake to try to do this before we built the dragon. If I did this or this before I had instantiated a dragon and actually populated the array with a real object, then I get a null pointer exception and my program would just crash. So we've done all that, and with that being done, now we can actually display it. And we could do something very similar to what we did up here. Matter of fact, if I just copy that for loop, hopefully save a little bit of time. Let's replace array of strings with array of dragons. And then contains the dragon. Same thing here. Array of dragons and let's go ahead and pull out our data as well via our accessor method, our accessor functions that we created. Um, and we're just going to concatenate. We'll call the array subscript value. All right. same thing this time I'm going to call get health but same thing the array and the subscript value and let's see let's add we'll drop down a line there for every one of these we'll drop down two lines and let me carry I don't know if that looks good Maybe I should carry some of this over here on the next few lines. Kind of go out of my margins there. All right, so we'll do that. All right, so two print statements, but see how that works. As x is incremented, it will go through the elements 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then we want to display the data for each one of those dragons. Okay, so that's building the array, that's populating the array. And then that's accessing the elements in the array once it's been built. So let's compile the project and generate the bytecode and then see what it looks like. Now notice these values here. In this case, this isn't the dragon's name, but it's just a memory address. And before when we were dealing with strings, we could display a string, you know, just by calling system.print. But there's no overloaded operator that can display a dragon as a string. So we're getting pretty much just you know, memory address values here, and that's not what we want. So we need to recode that part. And the other part is, um, I'm calling, you know, get name for both of these. I want to call get health here. So let's recode that real quick. So we get for copying and pasting it. And let's call get health, the accessor there. And then let's come up here, and although that would render a meaningful value for a string, it won't for a dragon. So to give it a meaningful value, let's just use x. x represents the subscript value, or the array index value. So I'm going to go ahead and add x in here and concatenate it. And we'll say contains dragon, just to illustrate that the subscript value is referenced by x. And terminate that with a period and again to keep it from wrapping around the margins I'll just move that on to the next line all right so let's rebuild the project generate the bytecode and display the results okay and now look and you can also notice here remember in the dragon class our constructor would display this string every time we built a dragon object well if you look here as we go through the array populating it in the first for loop here's all of our dragons being built right remember remember what happened here we built a new dragon so it's calling the constructor then we went through and we set all the values and after setting all the values in this case 
Here's the dragon's name, 0 through 9. Element 9 contains dragon 9. And you know, here we are actually adding to the value, in this case, health. The fill method. Next, let's take a look at the fill method of the array class of object. So once again, we're building an array of strings, and we're going to use the fill method. And we can specify an array, and then what to fill it with. So I'm going to fill it with the string literal in this example. And if I do that, it would be essentially be the same as if I you know, put it in a for loop, and I said the quick brown fox. But in this case, I can do it as a quick call to the fill method. And then to display each element, again, we're going to use a for loop. You know, oftentimes we will combine arrays with for loops or some type of repetition structure, while well, true loop, do well. So to run that, let me go, let me get a main real quick. And we're going to comment this one out. We're going to uncomment array functions fill so that we can run our fill function and let's see what happens. Okay, and so if you look here are 10 elements, array elements 0 through 9, and they're all, you know, they all have the same string, the quick brown fox. And that's good for populating an array or initializing an array with a certain kind of object. Using the fill method with class objects. So what about programmer defined objects? If we go through here, uh, let's go ahead and build an array of programmer defined objects. And we'll call it Y. And same thing. We'll set up an array of 10 elements or 10 objects, dragon objects. If we do that, let's call the fill method from the arrays class. Specify the array name. We called this one Y. And we can instantiate using the keyword new a new dragon for each object there. So let's, you know, we could do it with a for loop or we could do it with this method either way. But just to, sh to show you that it is synonymous, if I were to display now, it's only going to have the default values. Remember the default values were anonymous at 100 uh, in our dragon class. But just to show you, We just want to display that. Let's go ahead and test that out. Put those items together there. I don't know if that's more aesthetically pleasing or hopefully easier to follow, but let's go through. Okay. And so as we do, again, here is the fill method used with a, a simple object a string, and then here is the fill method used with a more sophisticated or a programmer defined class of object, just showing the default values and elements uh, indexed as 0 through 9, with the subscript value 0 through 9. Binary search and sort. Now let's take a look at two more array class methods. And the first one we're going to look at is sort. And it goes hand-in-hand hand with another function known as binary search. 
and you can use a for loop and use functions like equals or other methods to determine whether or not a certain value exists in an array. But you might have to search through all the elements in the array to find the value. Well, there's another way to do that, and that's using the binary search method. So using the binary search method, um, it basically trees, creates a binary tree all the way through the array. And that can dramatically or significantly shorten uh, the amount of time it takes to find an object when you perform a, a binary search. Well, to do that, you've got to sort things, in, you know, in this case, in ascending order. Um, so you would call the sort method, and I have two examples here, one of strings and one of integers, all right? So array X is of strings and array Y is of integers. And then what I can do is I'll call the binary search method from the arrays class, and these are static. Remember, static means that you don't have to instantiate or build an instance of the class to call a function or method from it. It exists, it's, it's a standalone method, so I could just use the class name, which is the arrays class dot sort, without insert, any sort of instantiation. So there are static methods, but what I'd want to do, I have two integers here, which we'll use to search each array. First, I'm declaring an array of strings, okay? And so we're going to sort the strings alphabetically. And it's numerical, but when you do it on strings, it'll simply, it's ASCII values. So it'll look at the ASCII values and sort things alphabetically. Inside the for loop, we're going to display the element and list the subscript value of the array. Then we're going to search for a string. We're actually going to look for an actual string, the word 6, not the integer 6. And to do that, we simply pass it in. There are many overloaded methods in binary search, and we can pass in integers, as parameters, you can pass in actual strings as parameters. You know, there's all kinds of, of um, overloaded arguments that we could pass in here. So the array is x, right? That's the array that we declared, and then we perform the sort on to put in ascending order. And then once we do that, we're looking in that array, and we're looking for the string value of 6. Okay, and then where it finds it, that, would, that value would be returned and stored with an x search, which is our integer up here. It's going to say the string x was found in element, okay, and that's if it finds it. And then, okay, searching for the string, now we're going to look for another string, 10, same thing. We're going to return the, the position, the element where we find it, okay, and then we'll s simply say where we found it. So let's take a look at that real quick. Oops, let me comment out, comment out this. And let me uncomment the binary search there. Okay. So sorting string values and array X alphabetically, and I'll try to display the code up here. So this we sort it and we're listing it right here in this for loop, right? Zero through nine. So it's just showing you, see how it, you know, E, F, N, O, S, T. So it sorted them alphabetically, all right, you know, based on their ASCII values. And then searching for string six, that's where we come down here. And we're passing in that argument as a parameter on the array X, our array of strings. And then we're gonna, the return result is the element where it actually finds that, okay? So string six was found in element six, and just by chance, the string six is actually stored in element six not intentionally, I had no idea, but just, just by chance. So string 6 is an element 6. Next we're going to look for the string 10 in the same array, and again return the element, right, and store that in this integer. And where was that found? 10 was found in element 7. Again, because it's sorted alphabetically. Okay, so come down here. Now y is an array of type integer. So 10 integers, sorting the integer array. Again, we're going to perform a sort. And then we're going to build a for loop and go through and display the sorted values on the subscript value of y, the index value. So element 0 through 9 provides us values 1 through 10. Remember, arrays are off by 1, that fence post issue. So where do we find integer 6? Integer 6 is an element 5 because it's off by 1. Right? That's where, and this time, instead of searching for a string, notice that it's, you know, it's overloaded. We're searching for an integer, but it still handles it just the same. And the integer was, you know, in this case, what we're searching for was found in element 5. 
the equals method. We could also utilize um, the equals method, but that wouldn't be as efficient. Um, say we were looking for the value 10. Um, we'll go through here and I'll just give you an example. I'll make another for loop and we'll do the same thing we're doing here. All right, inside of our for loop, we'll go through every single element in our array x. And let's take our subscript value. And let's say if x, lowercase x, and then we can call, see all these methods that are available to us on a string, an array of strings? Lots and lots of methods, but the particular one we're interested in, in this case, let's say we're gonna do this manually without a binary search. And we could just pass in 10, all right? And then here we'll just display. Oops, on a tiny little netbook right now, so keyboards. <clears throat> so we'll say we found that value and then on what iteration it is, okay? And let's comment the rest of this out real quick. So we don't do that. All right, now a binary search <clears throat> would you know, take a, a maximum it would basically cut this in half and then it would check and see if the value were in the first half or the second half and then cut that in half. So, it, you know, not necessarily great with just 10, but imagine if there were a thousand or a hundred thousand or a million values we're trying to sort through. That's where a binary search could save us uh, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of iterations in the loop and therefore increase performance. But here, if I were to just to run this and do a, you know, a non-binary search, a manual search just using the method equals. Let's see what happens. Found 10 on the ninth iteration. So I had to cycle through and go through all these elements just to get to 10. Whereas on the other hand, if we did a binary search, we'll comment this out. then the number of iterations, you know, elements we'd have to search through would be far less because it is a binary tree. Let's look at ragged arrays. These are also called non-rectangular or asymmetrical array structures. Java allows um, what are called ragged arrays, um, or in this case, non-rectangular arrays. And most arrays that you create are rectangular in the sense that, um, you know, their columns, you know, regardless of how many rows you have, the number of columns per row should be the same. And that's the idea of a symmetrical or rectangular array. And those are the most efficient type. Now you can create, you know, arrays that have rows with an irregular number of columns in Java. But be aware there is a speed penalty, all right, or there's you know, an efficiency or performance disadvantage for creating ragged arrays. But technically you can if you want to. In other words, I could create, you know, a row, a record set, um, if I were doing a two-dimensional array. And I could have four rows, and, you know, in this case, an unspecified number of columns. And this would allow me to create a ragged array. So, you know, my four rows would be indexed zero through three, zero, one, two, three. And I could have three columns and one, six, nine, and twelve, respectively, all the way down. So yes, you can use or create ragged arrays in Java if you need to. But most of the time you would probably not want to do that. 
just because of the speed and performance issues, you want to use symmetrical or rectangular arrays. Once again, let's review some of the array class methods. As a quick review, here are some array class methods. Remember, they're all static, so you can use them without instantiating the array. And in addition, a very useful data member or attribute is the length attribute, which will automatically give you the number of elements in the array. Uh, anyway, the static methods that you would probably find most useful are binary search, equals fill, and the sort method. And here's just some examples of using these static methods, whereas this would actually be called on the instance of the array bit. Some of the more common, commonly used and useful array methods. Let's take a look at declaring, initializing, and using three-dimensional arrays. Lastly, we've taken a look at a single dimension and two-dimensional arrays. Let's take a look at a three-dimensional array. So in this function 3D array, we've declared an array of three dimensions, three dimensions x, y, z. Typically, uh, which could be used to you know look at the x, y, and z axis in a three-dimensional program or game. So if you look at how it's initialized, inside these you know, outermost braces are the three uh, dimensions, okay? The first dimension, there's, you know, it would basically be subscript, subscripted as 222, two, two, so x0, x1, and then each of those is going to have y0 and y1, and then each of those would have a z0 and z1 value for each one of those. And then if we created a nested for loop structure, with three nested for loops, we could display it like so by calling the function 3D array. So let's just call that from main. And we'll just build the project and call it. And let's see how that works. All right, so the subscript value is gonna be X, Y, and Z accordingly. And you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in our three dimensional array. Let's review how a multi dimensional array subscript values are indexed within a repetition structure. Perhaps it bears mentioning, um, or maybe it's worthwhile reviewing, how the subscript values work with our repetition structures. In this outermost loop, that's x. In other words, this and this. So for every single iteration of x, we're going to go through y0 and y1. That's two iterations here. And for every single iteration of y, we're going to iterate twice with z. So that's our 1 and our 2. Then it loops back, all right? And then it goes to this, you know, this goes twice, 1, 2, and then it loops back and then goes to the next, which is y1, and then displays 3 and 4. Again, two more iterations nested inside of here. And then finally, when that's repeated twice, it goes back here, and x progresses to the next set of elements. It was 0, now it's 1. And the same thing happens all over again, 5, 6, and 7, and 8.